Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So we all know that trust in the largely left-wing mainstream media is at an all-time low. Of course, some journalists are worse than others, for example, Jim Acosta. However, possibly one of the worst mainstream media journalists actually hails from Australia. His name is Mark DiStefano, who until last Friday afternoon worked for the Financial Times in the UK as their media and tech reporter. Prior to that, he worked for BuzzFeed for five years, three years in Australia, two years at BuzzFeed UK. And recently, he's got himself into an awful lot of trouble. But I should give you some context. I mean, after all, why would I make a video about an individual reporter who's behaved badly? I mean, aren't they just a dime a dozen nowadays? Well, sure. But this particular reporter made it his mission over the past couple of years to demonetize, deplatform, and destroy a few people that I and I'm sure a lot of you hold dear. Sargon of Akkad, Count Dankula, and Tommy Robinson. All of which I will explain, but for now, here's the Mark situation. It has been alleged that on April 23rd, Mark DiStefano thought it was a good idea to sneak into private Zoom calls attended by staff at The Independent and The Evening Standard, in which personal information about pay cuts, furloughs and dips in revenue were being relayed to staff. He then live tweeted the contents of the call and soon after, The Financial Times published an article by Mark that included these confidential details. Now, this isn't very ethical to say the least and is absolutely in breach of the Financial Times Code of Conduct, which states, The press must not seek to obtain or publish material acquired by intercepting private or mobile telephone calls, messages or emails. Engaging in misrepresentation or subterfuge can generally be justified only in the public interest and then only when the material cannot be obtained by other means. It is also perhaps in breach of UK law in the form of the Computer Misuse Act, although it seems that The Independent and The Evening Standard will not be pressing charges. Anyway, after The Independent alerted the Financial Times, they suspended Mark pending an investigation. And on Friday afternoon, Mark tweeted this. Hi. Letting everyone know today was my last day at The Financial Times. This afternoon I offered my resignation. Thank you everyone who has given support. I'm now going to take some time away and log off. Make of that what you will, but either way, he's out of a job. So just how did Mark get caught? Well, bizarrely, he logged into the Zoom call using his Financial Times email address. And while, yes, his video was turned off, this caused his name to flash up on the screen, which was seen by other people on the call. He logged off after about 16 seconds, only to log back in again five minutes later on an anonymous account with the video turned off. Only that anonymous account was attached to his phone number, which along with his name appearing on the screen made it all too easy for the good people at The Independent to work out who had gate crashed their call. Ugh. Idiot! This led to an apology from the Financial Times and Mark's resignation after working there for only three months. This complete lapse in basic computer skills is very ironic considering Mark made his name in Australia back in 2015 by exposing former leader of the Australian Labor Party Mark Latham for operating what appeared to be a parody Twitter account in his own name which was hurling some rather nasty comments at various women in the media. Mark DiStefano exposed the fact that the actual Mark Latham was indeed behind the apparent parody account by revealing that Latham had linked his personal email address to the account. Five years later, Mark DiStefano makes pretty much the exact same mistake. Whoops. So, now you know the sequence of events, why is this important? Well, Mark DiStefano is the dirty, dirty smear merchant who, through false framing, misrepresentation of facts, removal of context and outright lies, is responsible for the demonetization and or deplatforming of YouTube commentators Sargon of Akkad, Count Dankula and Tommy Robinson. You see, Sargon, Tommy and Dankula committed the cardinal sin of running as MEP candidates for UKIP. And since to Mark DiStefano and those like him, anyone who is not to the left of Stalin is a far-right racist, he appeared to see it as his solemn duty to savage and destroy them using subterfuge and deceit. And the most effective way of doing that was to hit them in the wallet. Now, What's interesting about this is that while Mark didn't really have any sway with YouTube in Australia, when he moved to the UK, he all of a sudden seemed to have this magic power to have YouTube channels of people he ideologically opposed demonetized seemingly overnight just by lobbying the powers that be. 
which is a big deal since YouTube is of course a huge company. Gosh, I wonder how he managed it. But this video isn't about Sargon, Tommy, or Count Dankula. This is about my experiences with Marc de Stefano when he was a reporter for BuzzFeed Australia in 2017. Marc was always a left-wing activist at heart who seemed to think that journalism was nitpicking at random things your least favourite politicians do and putting it on the internet in the form of image listicles. Some examples of his work are WTF is going on in the Senate, literally 40 tweets about normal people running into politicians, and the internet has discovered the Attorney General's signature looks like a Mr. Squiggle. Now, don't get me wrong, I have nothing against fluffy articles. I have written plenty of them in my time, especially when I worked at an online women's magazine. I have a whole series on my YouTube channel dedicated to fluffy news called This Week in Social Justice, for goodness sake. But I don't go around acting like a hard-nosed, serious journalist while I'm doing it. However, Mark's regressive leftist activism was also evident. Like his reporting on the parliamentary debate on changing speech laws in Australia to prevent vexatious claims of racial discrimination, of which there had been many, and to ensure free speech. Mark, however, characterised this debate as changing race-hate laws, while emphasising that the politicians voting to change the laws were white, the not-so-subtle implication being that changing the laws was racist. He also had a bit of a fixation with Breitbart News and the alt-right for a while there, which leads me to where Marc de Stefano and I met back in 2017. Yep, I know Marc de Stefano, and just like Sargon Dankula and Tommy, he low-key tried to destroy me as well. Not on anywhere near as grand a scale, I mean this was back when I had just started doing TV. I didn't even have my YouTube channel at that point. I was a non-entity with maybe a thousand or so followers on Twitter, and I'd written a few articles criticising SJWs. That's it. I was objectively a nobody. But for some reason, Mark and a few other Australian regressive leftist journalists got a bit of a ping on about me. Most of them were content with just whinging about me on Twitter, which they did constantly, but Mark went further. He engaged in the same tactics of subterfuge, smearing and attempted intimidation that he used on Sargon, Count Dankula and Tommy Robinson in order to put a stopper on my career before it had even begun. He didn't do this by hitting me in the wallet. He couldn't. I wasn't making any money out of my conservative commentary at the time. What I think he wanted to do instead was humiliate me off the scene. He wanted to disparage me and attack my credibility to the point where I was too embarrassed and intimidated to write or do TV or tweet or anything. Obviously that didn't work, but judging by his behaviour at the time and since, that was probably his endgame. As such, I think it's appropriate for me to be wonderfully cliched right now and say, story time! I had the, um, privilege of appearing on a panel with Mark in February 2017 on a TV show called The Drum. This show is on the ABC, which is Australia's equivalent to the BBC and is even more left-wing. The topic was Milo Yiannopoulos a couple of days after it had been revealed that he had made those, shall we say, unfortunate comments. It was only my second TV panel appearance ever. I was very, very new, very green, and had not realised that the ABC had majorly stacked the panel against me. Put simply, it was me against three, and boy, did it go off. Mark? No, I, I just, I just think that we've <gasps> someone who's a free speech, a this. free speech absolutist, which Milo is. He says no, that everything you, needs just to be look, on the record. Hang on a minute. Here's you can be a free speech. No, just, stop talking. No, you you're just, you're just trying to shut down the conversation well, actually, and well, reframe it. And it's just you. so strange. I, I will have to insist that one person speak at a time. Perhaps <laughs> we, we have to stop fighting, dear. Perhaps we can hear later. We'll hear from Mark. We've heard from Daisy. Now. On that panel, Mark tried to insist that Milo was part of the alt-right. This was blatantly untrue. Not only had Milo frequently denounced them, to the point where he had insisted the LA Times print a retraction after they described him as such, but an actual alt-right website had declared a holy war on Milo, renouncing and rejecting him totally because he is gay, pro-Israel, half-Jewish and exclusively dates black men. Can I, can I speak? All of you are at least on some level quite wrong. First of all, Milo is... <laughs> Stop. 
Milo is not the alt-right. The alt-right won't have him because he's a gay Jew who dates exclusively so, black okay, men. Well, let's not talk about what he's he is. Not, what he is. Right, he's 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 the, right. the tech Second, writer for Breitbart. Secondly, Breitbart is the alt-right platform. That is it calls a itself flippant the... comment that Steve Bannon made a while ago. If you actually read Breitbart, I it do. is simply conservative news. And what you on the left have started to do, you've decided to label everything that's conservative as somehow controversial. All of which Mark would most likely have known, but since he didn't like Milo's opinions, he didn't seem to care. Typical lefty. From that day on, Mark seemed to have a bit of an interest in me. Not to the point where he was stalking or fixated or anything like that, gosh no. But he certainly paid what you would call a disproportionate amount of attention to me, given my relative non-status at the time. It started when Mark fanned the flames of a rather awful Twitter pylon in March that year, of which I was the centerpiece slash punching bag over a non-political article that I had written. The pylon was started by an Australian feminist, Dee Madigan, and lasted about 30 or so hours because apparently she and other fully grown adults had literally nothing better to do with their time. <laughs> I love living rent free in people's heads. Now, if you want a bit of an idea of what kind of a person Dee Madigan is, she appeared on television on April 12th, 2017, wearing a t-shirt that had Union Thug painted across the front. I should also point out that to this day, the only piece of my work that Dee has had the apparent guts to have a go at was that single article I had written at the time that wasn't actually making a political point. My, what a big brain she has. Anyway, since the article contained some sensitive subject matter, I asked my editor to just take it down for a few hours so I could have a little bit of a chance to edit it and make it, you know, less raw. Mark decided to capitalize on this, not because it was hard news or in the public interest or a cutting edge piece of reporting. He simply saw it as an in to smear and attempt to discredit my editors and me because the article had been taken down and edited. I don't know what mental gymnastics he had to go through in order to find an issue with that, but desperate to have a dig, somehow he got there. Of course it didn't work, since nobody actually cared beyond the little cesspool of ignorant plebs that is Australian left-wing Twitter. But as we've seen, Mark is a smear merchant by trade, not a journalist, and since he didn't have any kind of intellectual argument against my conservative opinions, low-hanging fruit was his only tool. The next incident came a few weeks later on Twitter. Now just a quick bit of background about this. I went to high school with the daughters of Australian Conservative former Prime Minister Tony Abbott, and one of them was in the same grade as me. It was a private school on the posh side of Sydney. Yes, I am a private schoolgirl. <laughs> Granted, it was the less posh end of the posh side of Sydney, but still pretty posh. Anyway, one day on Twitter, I saw that Mark had tweeted something that I felt was quietly disparaging of the Abbott girls. He tweeted that he didn't know whether it was funny or interesting that they had gone to the second most apparently overfunded school in Australia, according to a report that had just come out at the time. Now just to warn you, this next bit of the video is going to be a little bit tricky since Mark deletes all his tweets every six months. However, the incident is seared into my memory and I have a number of people who can corroborate it. Now I've seen the Abbott girls get disparaged on the internet quite a bit because of who their father is. And since I went to school with them, I've always kind of felt vaguely protective of them, I guess. I interpreted Mark's tweet as a subtle dig at them as well as their father, so I, deci I decided to step in. I replied with, they're in good company, so did I. To which Mark replied, yes, that's right, Louise's year, wasn't it? Now this surprised me. I wasn't sure why Mark would know or even care about which high school I went to. I mean, look, it's easy enough to find out via a Google search and really not hard to put two and two together given Louise and I are the same age. So I tweeted back, Googled me again, have you? To which he replied rather insidiously, didn't need to, I had my sources. Now I had no idea what he meant by that, so I just tweeted back sarcastically, of course you did, and left it at that. But it really got me wondering. If not Google, then what did he mean by sources? Who had he been talking to? 
What had he done to acquire that information? It was weird. Now, to this day, I do not know for sure whether he just said that to intimidate me. I mean, that might have been the case. But given extenuating circumstances, it might have been something else. You see, Mark also went to a private school on the posh end of Sydney, a fact that was relayed to me at the time by an acquaintance. Just in passing, it was not information that I was digging for and I certainly didn't care about it. In fact, his private school was not too far from my private school and there was a bit of social crossover. Since Mark and I are about the same age, we had mutual friends, obviously, which I evidently didn't know about. So here's my thinking. Mark, via perhaps a bit of a social media stalk, had possibly found these mutual friends and had been talking to them about me, hence his so-called sources. And knowing what I know of him, it's very possible he was trying to dig up dirt on me as far back as high school, which I had left over a decade ago, to use against me professionally and personally. Just let that sink in. But the funniest thing about the mutual private school situation is that although Mark pertains to be a man of the left, so one with the everyman defending the downtrodden and the underprivileged from evil, rich, racist oppressors, he's really just as prissy and bourgeois as I am. The difference is, I don't pretend not to be. Let him eat cake. Then, of course, there was the time he apparently Facebook stalked me and found a delightful page that has since been taken down, unfortunately, called the Daisy Cousins Appreciation Society, which was set up by a fan of mine. At the time, I did not know who had set it up, but we have since corresponded, and he is a lovely fellow. Anyway, Mark tweeted a screenshot of the page with a snarky comment, the implication being, of course, that I had created the page for myself. Also, he knew it would incite the trolls and that I would certainly cop it from them. Now, of course, I quickly pointed out that I had not, in fact, created my own fan page and threw it back at him by suggesting that maybe Mark himself had created it. I also pointed out how weird I found the amount of attention he had apparently invested in trying to find out things about me online. And if you're at all in doubt about the fact Mark told me he had his sources about my high school days, look at the language I used in this tweet. I said he sourced what high school I went to rather than Googled, stalked, found out, etc., which is much, much more instinctive language. But the cherry on top of my dealings with Mark Stefano came in June 2017. Soon after I began my relationship with my now fiancé, I received this private message on Twitter from Mark, a screenshot of mine and Callum's recently changed relationship status on Facebook on our personal, private pages. I don't know why Mark found my personal life so interesting, but there you go. Neither Callum or myself were or had ever been Facebook friends with Mark, nor had I put anything about our newly begun relationship on Twitter, which meant that Mark would probably have had to engage in yet another random Facebook search of things pertaining to me. However, note the order of the names on this screenshot. See, the thing is, this time it wasn't my page he was perusing. Speaking of my now fiancé, At the end of 2016, after a frivolous but high-profile lawsuit against me was thrown out, Mark became obsessed with me. He wrote three articles about defamation proceedings I brought against a Labour politician. Settled favourably, by the way. But it wasn't enough for Mark to report public statements and court documents. Instead, he turned into a stalker. Mark started trying to dig up dirt and stalk my Facebook for anything he could use to smear me. He reported that I was a member of some secret racist Facebook group. Mark sent messages to people from this secret racist Facebook group and included screenshots of people posting his messages to the group and laughing at him. Does this mean that Mark was a member of it too? Very naughty, Mark. I guess you're a racist by your own logic. Not satisfied with creeping on strangers, Mark even emailed my employer about this secret racist Facebook group. Sorry, Mark, it didn't work. Mark then started messaging friends of mine, trying to add them on Facebook and trying to get any dirt he could to attack me. It was getting pretty weird and I was getting a bit fed up with this slimy stalker. So I changed my profile picture and name to Mark's. Did he get the joke? Did he understand that I was not so subtly calling out his obsessive stalking? No. Mark again emailed my employer and published the most pathetic article about it as though he had got me, exposed me. No, Mark, you are an idiot. And despite your best attempts, I still have my job, unlike you. It's not personal, son. So by this point, some of you may still be wondering why I chose to make this video. 
Is it because I bear a grudge or because I'm vindictive or vengeful since Mark tried his darndest to make my life as difficult as possible and also to get my fiance fired as well as just generally seeking to ruin people he disagrees with by lying about them and destroying their livelihoods? Well, yeah. But aside from that, I want people to know what he did, how he operates, and just what kind of awful underhanded journalists there are out there as a reminder to you all to never ever ever trust what you're being fed by the left-wing mainstream media. These kinds of people lurk all over the place nowadays since the media left is so salty and ideologically desperate. They are the thugs of the communication landscape. Mark DiStefano was just unlucky he got caught. So from me to all of you, beware of what you read, hear, and see. It might be coming from another journo just like Mark. If you like that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave a comment, and if you really, really like it, check out the video description for Daisy's subscribe star link and other ways you can support her. Mm -hmm.